so. We are live. We are live, I believe. Just double check in. Yep, yeah, same group. So um, let's make sure everything's working, everything's recording. Triple check. Fantastic. It's working. So um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of uh, the Shift Success Facebook Live series. Seems like we're going a bit crazy at the minute with the lives. Um, and I am joined by another one of our uh, superstars at Shift Success, another one of our clients on our cohorts. Um, and, you know, just give it a bit of an introduction. Um, I met this individual back in 2018. Uh, who uh, had a, already a business idea, but actually decided to knock that on the head. Um, she's then gone into uh, an industry, um, a niche, which she's done phenomenally well in, um, won national awards, um, been, you know, just recognized for the work that she's doing with that company. Um, she's then spotted another opportunity in the market and established another business. And um, due to the coronavirus and Unfortunately, that business has been put on hold for now. However, out of that, she has birthed another product or service, which is uh, going very, very well indeed. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome um, Lorna Reeves. How are you doing, Lorna? I'm, hi, I'm really good. Thank you. You're really, really well. Glad to be here. Look at that smile, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So um, what I'd like to start off by asking, uh, I want to start off by going through your police career. So for those who don't know you, um, what police force was you from? What did you do in the police? And, you know, how, how long was you there? And what, what was the day to day for you in that role? Uh, so I started my policing career in 2003. Um, and I did a total of 15 years, um, give or take a week. Um, started out life pretty much straight from school really as um, a crime scene examiner or CSI as it is in some forces um, working on burglaries and motor vehicle crime and slowly built up my expertise got promoted a few times um, and moved to specialize in firearms um, and eventually um, after various incidents, and I'm happy to go into those if you want to hear them, I moved away from Frontline um, and I moved to run the Forensics Lab for the Met. Met's one of the only um, forces in the country that has its own in-house laboratory. Um, so I took a promotion and that's where I finished out my career, um, managing a team of about 160 or so, uh, multi-million pound contracts and procurement and um, working at kind of national level. Um, yeah, and that's where I finished out my service two years ago. Awesome, awesome stuff. And we'll go into the instance in a second. You piqued my curiosity there. Um, for those who are just tuning in, we've got quite a few people watching now. Um, if you can hear us, um, like, engage, comment, so we can know that you can hear us loud and clear. If you've got any questions as well, please do drop them in and I'll ask Lorna for you during this live stream. Um, and if you're watching on replay, please do type in replay so we know you're watching again. Um, so that's amazing, Lorna. Um, talk to me about these incidents you, you speak of. What, what is this? <laughs> um, well, I think I think everybody has to go through these um, these kind of moments that make you reevaluate what you're doing with your life. And, and one of the big ones for me was um, I was doing my usual frontline job. Um, I'd been in around about 10 years at this point um, and um, the Met, like every force, had had its budgets cut and they got rid of um, forensic photographers, which then meant that the work had to go somewhere. So it landed on our doorstep as the scenes of crime offices. And I ended up having um, about seven dead bodies in about seven shifts. Um, and it, for the first time, um, I started to um, dream dream about my work and uh, really take it home with me and one of the the big ones for me is I went along to um uh, what I thought was going to be a routine hanging um, that you know that quick job at the end of the shift that you just think I'll just go and do that because that will help the night duty out um, and I got there and this poor probationer was there the only person I'd seen um, and he'd never had a dead body before um so uh, that 
or instantly made me really angry, really, really mad for him that, that was, this was his first experience. You know, it was grey and sweaty and not looking too well at all. Um, and to get into this room, we kind of had to force the door and the body because he was right behind the door, um, reasonably large gentleman. Um, and, and I suddenly thought, I can't have this officer in the room with me because if he faints, I can't get out. I, there's no way I can move this, this person on my own. So I ended up doing um, somebody else's job effectively inside the room because I was the only one in there. So as well as doing my job, I did the body search and I did um, the cutting down and all the things that don't actually fall into my remit and really had to support the officer through the process who didn't know what he was doing. He was trying to find his way through and not throw up at the same time. Um, and, and it was just, it just really made me angry. And I went back to the station and really, you know, laid into the skipper and the, and the, the governor and just said, you know, this is not okay. What you've done to this officer is not okay. And I think actually what I ended up carrying is actually it's not okay for me either. And it was a kind of cumulative effect. And from then on, when I went back into work, really started getting um, quite emotional, quite anxious, quite tearful. And that's not me. That's not really how I function. Um, so I said to my boss, um, look, this, this is what's going on for me right now. I, I just need a bit of support. I please, I don't want to go off sick. I don't want to come off shift. I just need a bit of a breather. I just need to not do dead bodies for a little while. And uh, his, his response was, you don't get to pick and choose. You just have to get on with it. Um, and and it was at that point that I said, you know what, I do get to choose photography is not in my contract. You can have all the kit back. And as I walked out the room, I thought I'm going to get promoted. I'm going to have your job and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it 10 times better. I ended up getting promoted above him, um, but that's um, by the by. But that that was my first big sort of trigger point, really, that actually things aren't quite right. Mm, okay Th th thanks for sharing that and in that story every time you tell it you know i've heard it a few times it you know it kind of frustrates me as well um because you know it's no one should be kind of treated like that really um with regards to this certain period working in the met is that when you started to think about a different career or did you you know wait a bit did you think about another job what was going on through your mind at that point yeah, when I decided I'd had enough of frontline, I definitely thought about getting a different job altogether. That was my first thought. Um, and then the opportunity for promotion came up, which is when I went into the lab. Um, and it was while I was in the lab, getting super stressed, getting ill with stress, um, you know, really not being in a good place at all, that I really started actively looking for another job. I thought I must be able to do something in a different industry you know I've got loads of skills I must be able to do something and actually the application processes didn't go well for me um, and it was also at that time that I started to um, look after myself a little bit better and started to do some things for me and that's where my kind of baking really took off and um, so one of my friends had a 50th birthday and said would you mind you know you do really do good desserts when we come over for dinner could you do my birthday cake so I made this big Tiffany-esque cake for her birthday. Um, she really liked it and I got loads of inquiries from it. So I thought, hmm, I could be onto something here. So I started doing cake making as a bit of a sideline um, and started taking quite a few orders over Christmas and big birthdays. Um, and that kind of Lorna Creates was a little sideline business that I had um, sort of 2017, 2018. Okay, awesome stuff. Um, you mentioned stress. So stress is a big um big factor that plays in a lot of members of the police um you know i know what kind of you went through um because i know you but for those who are listening right now and i think it's good for them to know because it may inspire them um what kind of stress was was you suffering Lorna? um intense and prolonged is probably the the fastest way of explaining it you know we all suffer stress and then i think some amount of stress is healthy it gets you to perform well but i went through um, a stress that uh, made my weight really fluctuate um, i was really thin and then i put on weight um, within sort of three three or four weeks um, it was really yo-yoing um, i barely slept if i got three hours of sleep a night that was a good sleep for me um so that wasn't that wasn't great and um I 
started getting stress eczema, so it started out on my main body, and then started creeping up my neck um, and up onto my face, which doesn't really look great. Um, and then my kind of body really reacted in a way that I didn't expect it to, and I ended up becoming incontinent. So at 31, 32, actually couldn't be much more than about 20 minutes from a toilet at any given time, um, which just was just awful. Wow. Wow. And, and how long did that last? You know, was it months or? Um, it probably went on for about three months before I started to see the doctor and get sort of in the NHS process. Um, and it was then that they identified that it was likely to be stress related. There was no sort of physical reason for it. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of at that point um, it was around Easter time, actually, that I was speaking to my wife about it and my not sleeping and she was seeing me deteriorate. And we, we both kind of said, I, I said, I'm not sure I can keep doing this. And she absolutely categorically said, you are not doing this anymore. You need to do something different. So we'll figure out the numbers. You just need to leave. And whether that's you ramp up your business or you just find a different job, you just need to stop doing what you're doing. You are, I, I describe it as I was walking on cracking ice. It would have been a matter of time before I would have been sectioned, before I'd have been institutionalized. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. So you're at this point of your police career. Um, you are now starting to get interest um with with cakes um, creating people's cakes and you set up your side hustle business which was a lawn of creates um so so how does that go you know how, how how did that go with that first side hustle business um hard work <laughs> it was um so i was essentially trading money for time you know i was charging not very much for my cakes sort of 50 to 100 pounds which in the cake world is not that much money for bespoke cakes um i was pretty much spending every weekend and evening baking when i wasn't at work which is when you're not sleeping anyway um you can imagine how that's going um and i was just about making ends meet in terms of day-to-day -day costs um but I had incurred quite a bit of debt in terms of getting somebody to set up my website because I really didn't know what I was doing um, and trying to figure out whether I should be a sole trader or not and trying to get set up with the council because I was a food business and really fumbling my way around quite a lot and I think I, I was never I reached the point where I knew I would never make a lot of money from it without hiring commercial kitchens um, I was kind of at that spot where I couldn't physically do any more in the kitchen and Sharon wouldn't divorce me because she couldn't get in to cook her dinner at any point <laughs> okay awesome stuff okay so when you start probably recognizing the cake business hasn't got legs um I think that's when you decided to attend the success quick start day um at that day you actually came up with my on my weddings do you want to explain what that business is that phenomenal business you have yeah it was it was one of the brainstorming sessions with robin actually and we we talked and he does a brilliant piece on products and we talked through what am i selling how much am i selling it for and you know what is the what is the turnover going to be with that how how are you going to make a living out of that and actually running the numbers with somebody else is is quite stark um, and and does make you realize um the reality of the situation and then we were talking around, okay, what do you know about? What can you do? What um, experiences you've got? What's your story? Um, and I started to think about um, the whole wedding industry. So not just cake, um, but what else is, is knocking around there. And, and I thought, well, okay, when I planned our, I planned our wedding, that was good. I've planned my, um, helped my sister with hers and I planned a good friend of ours by this point. Hmm, maybe there's something in this I can do planning and organizing I do it every single day with lots of people could I take it a step further and that's when we started to really knock around the idea of niching and um, how do I break into this really saturated market what do I know that other people don't know mm -hmm. um, and that's when I really hit upon the idea of um, LGBT weddings um, LGBTQ plus weddings <laughs> and and it was it was just an idea at first. I thought I, I had a tough time when we I planned hours. I say I planned hours. There was some involvement. 
Um, <laughs> And I, and I remember having the conversation with every venue and every supplier about, um, you know, we'd like to come and have a look around. Oh, OK, what's your husband to be's name? No, not my husband. I'm marrying a woman. Her name is Sharon. And it was it was just that frustrating conversation over and over and over again, which just takes the shine off the, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and I thought I can't be the only one. Um, so, yeah, bit of desktop research, quite a lot of desktop research. and. Um, maybe three months later, and actually my oh my, um, as the UK's only LGBT dedicated wedding planning service was born. Amazing. So that was actually going to be my next question. That's a phenomenal <laughs> story. So if I was going to meet you in a, in a bar and we didn't know each other, I was, and I said to you, you know, what do you do? Is that what you would say? Depends who you are. <laughs> okay. Because I've now got the two businesses, it's, it's very much I now pitch for the person that I'm speaking to. Okay. So if I if I thought you were a potential wedding prospect, yes, that is exactly what I would say. That I'm the founder and director of the UK's um, best LGBT wedding planning company, um, and we work to make individual unique days for our couples. No cookie cutter weddings. We do your day your way. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, dead clear. So who is your typical customer? I know you know LGBTQ plus. Um, but, you know, is it someone who's frustrated, who's got a lack of time, who's a high income earner? What is that typical customer for you for my or my weddings? So I'm super clear on um, my avatar. My avatar is Ethan. Um, he earns around 85 grand a year um, and has a partner. Um, generally, I work with same sex couples, but I leave it wide open because LGBTQ is so vast. Um, they work hard, usually are um, fairly high flying in their roles. They like the finer things in life, nice cars. Um, you know, they work out generally, they're quite fitness focused. Um, they, they, they do well for themselves. If you've got the choice between a high street brand of jeans or a designer brand of jeans, they're probably going to pick the designer. You know, they're Waitrose, Marks and Spencer shoppers. Um, but they're my kind of go to people. They play hard they work hard and they don't really quibble over pennies they like good value and good quality but it's not generally about the money wow wow okay so you've really so you've not only got a niche you've actually thought more about their demographics and psychometrics you know things they're interested in their spending habits which is which is really, really specific um what type of problems do you solve Lorna so you know if if, if Ethan was going to come to you what problems do you actually solve for Ethan? Generally, uh, my clients have uh, three issues. They are short on time um, because they are high flying in their jobs. Um, they don't. They want their day to be perfect. They are the type of people that love a bit of Instagram at the weekends. Um, and they want no stress. They've got enough stress in their day to day work or their day to day life that they don't need any extra. So saving the time, saving the stress and um, the guarantee of it of perfection mm. um, is generally what I work to. Amazing. Amazing. OK, so that's the problems you solve. But can you talk to us about the process you would do in actually solving those problems? Because uh, I can imagine it's a wedding, someone's big day. Um, how would you go about making sure it's perfect? And, and yes, the process can be um, fairly massive there's lots of different bits that all go together um, but first off I, um, I have a chat with them we have a discovery call and find out even you know if we are a good fit um, and if we both get on we're, we're all on the same page and um, that's when I kind of put them into um, my my process my product process which is the five d's so we do discovery we, and we then we do um the dream phase which is like tell me what you want your wedding to look like tell me what you want it to feel like um, and then we do the a real lot around um, i get them to do pinterest boards because it's a really quick way for them to um visualize what's in their head you can say chic to somebody and we'll think of two different things. So by getting them to do something like a Pinterest board makes it really clear, makes me understand what's going on inside their brain. You then move into the design phase, um, which is um, chunking it up into the big decisions. So your venue, um, your uh, photographer, the big chunky bits that you need to get in place to make it to make it fit. 
Um, we then work through um, the different decisions um, and then we work in, into the actually delivery itself. So by chunking it up into small bits, one, it helps me stay organized and two, it helps the client stay focused. So they only have to make certain decisions at certain points along the pathway. They don't have to think about the whole thing, which can feel really overwhelming and big. Amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, so you actually made your first sale. Um, do you want to share when that was in your journey? Um, so you can, you can, you know, tell everyone. So I launched, officially launched my and my weddings on um, the 30th of June, 2018. Um, which was significant because I, I really wanted to launch in Pride Month. Um, so it coincides with um, Pride London really well, and I could pretty much launch off the back of that platform. Um, and four weeks later, I made my first sale, uh, which was for five and a half grand. Wow. So, so there's a few questions around that. Um, first of all, how did you feel knowing that you've had your first sale in that time frame? Oh my God, so many emotions. Mostly I was going <laughs> on the phone while the client is saying yes and I'm following up, trying to be really professional in my voice. I'm fairly sure I hit mute and went <laughs> in the background. Um, and then a real rush of relief that actually somebody wants to buy this product. It, it's not just an idea that I've plucked out of the sky, that it is tested, that it is working, that somebody does want to buy my products. So it's a bit of um, justification and validation. Um, and I'm not sure who che cheered more, actually, uh, me or James White. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, James. That's amazing. Um, you know, with regards to that as well, you know, five and a half thousand pounds is, is a lot of money um, for each sale. Um, knowing what you was, I mean, how much is you earning in, in the job? 50K? 50, like 55K a Great. year. So, so you made five and a half grand from one sale. How did that make you feel compared to your salary in the job? You know, because you're making that kind of money inside four weeks and that's one client and you're not spending, you know, 40 plus hours in the job and you're making that from your business. You know, what kind of value skew are you feeling from that? It, the big the big justification for me and the big bonus point was all of that money is for me and my company. Mm. that I've done the work I've put the time in I've created something and now I'm getting paid my worth so it's not about how much profit came off that and it, it, it wasn't relevant at that point it was more about the the value of five and a half grand rather than the actual money of five and a half grand mm -hmm. um, and I I don't for the work that I was doing for in that job I should have been paid a lot more I think police in general should be paid vastly more than they than they are um you know for the value of work they do but that was really it really gave me the confidence and I it shifted my mindset that actually I am worth what I charge mm. um, and people will pay it when they see quality and good value they will pay it amazing amazing stuff um talk to me about the awards so you won some awards as well for my on my weddings do you want to talk to me about that yeah, first first year of business, I um, was nominated for and then won Best Wedding Planner of the Year 2019, um, which was pretty epic. I dragged my sister to um, Liverpool with me and we had a night on the tile celebrating that win. Um, and then um, also in that year, I was nominated and shortlisted for um, National Diversity Awards, which was amazing for me. And even though Okay, I didn't walk away with the trophy that night, but to be shortlisted out of, I think it was something in the region of 25,000 nominations um, and to be shortlisted for Entrepreneur of Excellence was, was just phenomenal. The national diversity is what I'm all about. That's the other side of my, my weddings. It's about shifting the representation in the wedding industry. It's about normalising the non-normal so really taking the focus away from your very skinny blonde bride sorry anybody that's skinny and blonde and a bride um and really trying to normalize every, everybody else and try and get that representation up so to be recognized for that at the national awards was was just amazing it is absolutely amazing um that's you know that's phenomenal with with my on my weddings you know how you built that so soon but i want to talk about now my oh my events um 
now I want you to do, you know, if I was going to meet you in a bar and I was a prospect <laughs> um, and uh, I was a prospect you want to do business with, how would you introduce yourself? Usually I scope you first and find out if you are my, my client, um, my target client, um, but I'm Lorna Reeves, um, the founder and director of My and My Events. We build aspirational um, business events for entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, so that's about getting rid of grey walls and boringness and really making the um, event an experience for your participants. Fantastic. OK. And what kind of problems are you solving for those types of customers? Generally, they're people who are awesome at what they do, um, but they don't want the stress and the hassle of setting up face to face events. Um, I free up their time. I free up their headspace so they can just arrive on the day and be amazing. I take away all the hassle of dealing with um, delegates and all of the logistics for them. And um, I just ensure and guarantee that their day is going to be successful so that their brand is elevated and their reputation is maintained. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I want to talk about this business because there's been some, um, you know, with, with weddings, you know, same, but with, with my, my, you know, events, um, it's kind of a new brand and business that you've built and, you know, you're well on your way to hitting that six figure mark. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Mr. or Mrs. Coronavirus comes around and gives you a left hook. Um, in that moment, knowing that you can't run events face to face anymore, how do you feel knowing that you've built these businesses, pure hard work, you know, you're getting yourself out there, your name, and then all of a sudden it's stopped overnight, essentially. How, how does that, how does that make you feel? It was, it was intense. Um, and it, and it really happened quickly. Um, and was a flash. I can, I can still remember it. We were um, away skiing. Um, my first skiing holiday in a long time. And uh, we would, we'd been following the news and I was still convinced that Corona was just this little flu and nobody needs to panic. You know, we'll figure it out when it gets to us. Um, and then I started seeing that countries were shutting down and ski resorts were shutting down and, you know, the UK was fixing probably to shut down shortly. And I just remember sitting um, in our room in the chalet and just said to Sean, what am I going to do? I've got nearly a hundred grand's worth of business in the next nine months to deliver. I can't do any of it. And I don't know how long for. I've got plans for the business you know I've set strategies I'm just starting to take on um like team members and um people to help me deliver all this stuff and for probably about five minutes and that's not an exaggeration it was no longer than five minutes I thought I don't know what I'm going to do here um I don't know how I'm going to keep these businesses running if I can't do face-to-face -face events what am I going to do and then it was almost instant that I literally stood up and I thought, well, we can just shift them online. We'll just we'll just shift everything online. We've got the technology. Everyone's got Wi-Fi. And I was on my laptop doing emails. I thought I'm in France and I'm running my business from France. We can do face to we can do face to face virtually. Why can't we do that? And it was then I jumped on my phone and I texted a few people. I texted you. I texted a couple of the other mentors and I said, I'm thinking of doing this. Is it ridiculous or is there something in it? You know, I just needed to sound it off. And just that somebody came back, I can't remember who was first, and just said, yeah, it sounds good, flesh it out. Um, and it was just that almost instantaneous um, switch that I thought, okay, somebody's thrown me a lifeline in my own head. I've got, I've got to swim with it. I've got to see where this takes me. I've got to then try and build it and get something out quickly. People are going to be panicking and worrying. I need to deliver this quickly. That, you know, that's an amazing attitude. Um, what in that moment, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm interested about the psychology behind this. There's people out there who businesses have been impacted, right? Um, and unfortunately, things get put on hold. And there's, there, and there's some people in there, you know, who just don't want to carry on. They, they quit. And, you know, there's entrepreneurs like yourselves who pivot, adapt and overcome. Um, why did you take that route i mean because it's the easy thing to do is to say you know i'm putting this on pause for the time being you know i'm just going to wait out i'm just going to see how things go why did you not have that you know almost defeatist attitude i think my whole 
psyche is different now. I was always quite a cynical and quite negative person. And I think my default position previously would always have been, oh, well, you know, the world's against me. I might as well just stop. And actually, since building two businesses, I fought too bloody hard to let them go. And I'm not just going to sit around and wait for people to say that I can get back doing events again. Who gets to dictate when I can start earning money? I do. That's who gets to dictate. I get to make the choices. I could choose and it would be a valid choice to say I'm going to put everything on hold and I'm going to spend the next three months on self-development. It could be a choice. But for me, it wasn't. I, I had this idea and I believe that things smack you in the back of the head for a reason. Um, and, it, and it just did. Uh, I just thought I cannot sit here and be done to. I need, I need some element of control. And by choosing to launch something new, to develop something new and help other people, I'm going to help myself out of this hole as well. Phenomenal. It's just, it's a great mindset. And I want everyone to take away from that because it's true. You know, we can't control the coronavirus. We can't control this pandemic, but we can control our actions and our attitude um, in what we're going to do in business uh, or in life in general. So, you know, that's a great nugget. You know, I want everyone to take away. Um, you know, with regards to this new service that you've launched within my my events, you're you're making sales, and you know you're you've you have moved things online. You have customers now, which is giving you that income. Um, you know, through this time. But you know what's actually happens when this all goes away and we're allowed out in the world again. You've actually got live events still, and you've also got online events. So you know, this has almost been a gift in itself, a stressful gift, I can imagine, but a gift nonetheless. Um, with regards to the weddings as well, I believe you, you're still making sales on that, but for later on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my So all, all weddings have stopped and there's lots of people rescheduling, um, but I'm still getting inquiries from, you know, from work and connections I made a year ago when people weren't at actually ready to get married or were still in early relationships just by getting my content out getting known in the industry people are starting to come to me now and saying okay we know it's not going to happen this year but we'd like to look at next year wow. what can we do with that um so actually um my my weddings is becoming much more organic which is which is amazing um and and i'm really driving my my events and i think one of the big kickers for me was i've got this idea I'm not going to be the only person that's had this idea. I need to get it up and running now so that I can make a footprint, so that I can make a dent in that in that area before anybody else can. Loved it. Would you say you're a competitive person, Lorna? <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> I love it. No, I think it's good. Competition is good. A lot of people worry about the competition and you know, they can, it can actually put them down. Um, you know, I thrive in competition. I think a lot of people do if you use it in the good way, um, cause it gives you that kick up the bum that, you know, sometimes we need cause we're humans and we do procrastinate. Um, Lorna, what's some of the skill sets that you've had from the police that you've transferred into building these phenomenal companies? You know, what, what do you believe they are? Just some, um, I would say it's more than communication. I would say the ability to build relationships and build them fast with people. Mm. Um, I think police officers and staff have that. Um, the ability to prioritise, to be able to look at a spectrum of things and super fast make some really snap judgments that nine times out of ten are right. It's that, um, that intuition, that gut instinct. Mm. Um, I think they are super valuable. Um, and I think people that have been in the job have just got grit. And in fact, probably any public sector, they just they just get on with it. You know, you you know it's going to be hard. You know it's going to be a struggle, whether it's that shift or that set of nights that you've got to do. But you just get it done, and you do it to the best of your ability. And if you don't know how to do it, generally we'll figure it out. Mm. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, what some of the mindset differences that you've experienced from? you know, working in the police to, to now being an entrepreneur, what are those shifts you've, you've made in your mindset? I think I back myself more. I am willing to take more of a risk on myself because if I'm not going to take a risk on me, no one else is going to. Um, and, and I understand my value better. Um, and I actually won't work with clients who can't afford me. I won't drop my price for anybody 
um, you you need to understand my value and what I bring. That's, I think, the biggest mindset shift for me. And I think I'm less afraid. I'm less afraid of the uncertainty. That was my bit that my hardest bit of leaving the job was, you know, I'm leaving this really solid salary and effectively a job for life. You don't have to do too much to to get paid every month um, to actually uh, I'm I'm all I've got now. Uh, I am me and I am the one that's putting money in my bank account. But that doesn't scare me anymore. That actually fires me up. That that fuels me. Um, and yeah, I'm just not as scared anymore. There's you know nothing that bad is going to happen. There'll always be money. There'll always be jobs if I want one. If that's the worst that's going to happen at the end of all of this is I have to get a job. Well, nobody died. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. kind of it's that that kind of shift it's a different perspective mm, absolutely amazing um you know you've you've shared your story about being you know stressed and you know going through experiences in the met um you know building these companies as well um what is your life look now you know since joining shift success cult one and you know business is hard so i want everyone to listen to this you know business is hard it is a challenge but you've got phenomenal results and um, I want you know people to realize what does your life look like now? People know your world in the police typically watching this, but what does your world look like now? Still hard work, still bloody hard work. And some days, um, I think I, I logged on this morning the first time at 5.30 um, and I'm still here and I've still got another webinar after this. So it will be a long day, but it's a long day for me. Mm. Um, I enjoy most of my work. I don't mind doing banking very much, but I enjoy most of my day. Uh, and in the main, if I don't like it, I just don't do it. I outsource it or I cut that part, that process out of my business. I'm much freer to make my own decisions. And I spend more time with the people that I want to. I've got um, a different peer group. All of my peer group are positive. I don't have any negative Nellies I don't have anyone going oh isn't it crap isn't it awful it's just getting worse it's never going to get any better I don't I don't deal with that anymore I can put a post up on Facebook and guarantee that the first ones to be liking it will be my cohort buddies um either cheering me on or laughing with me or being supportive or offering advice it's just a completely different um experience that I'm in now and completely different group set amazing stuff amazing um what's been if you could pick one what's been a key highlight for you in your entrepreneur so far what's one that's that stood flat like what's been that oh yeah that was good oh decisions decisions um okay can i have two you can have two go on <laughs> thanks so <laughs> one would be collecting the award for best wedding planner 2019 that was kind of the moment that I thought, okay, I have drafted for a year. This is great. I, I, I'm actually being recognized for what I do. Um, and the other one would probably be securing a 17,000 pound contract with one client for one piece of business. And, and, and it was a cheeky number that I just said this much. And they went, yeah, okay, then damn it. I should have said more, but great. <laughs> yay. <laughs> Amazing. So that's, that's the key, you know, that's one of your, you know, 17 grand contract from one customer. Um, how did that make you feel like, cause that's a lot of money that from one client. It is a lot of money and it took me a long while and talking to get to that number, um, you know, with myself and with a couple of the other mentors, but I'm worth it. It was totally like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so 17 grand. Yeah, that's what I'm worth because I because I genuinely am. I'm good at what I do, but it's taken me a long time to realize that I'm good at what I do and that I should be paid for it. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, Lorna, what, what what's the vision for my my weddings and my my events? You know, where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? Um, well, my my events is already European. Um, so in the next three years, it will be international. Um, I have just started taking on a team. So I'd anticipate we maybe have three, maximum of five. I really want to be keeping it lean. Um, I'd love to be up near the half million pound, working towards a million pound business in that three years. Um, and, and really 
being the go-to person. If you don't want a boring four wall event anymore, that you want people to remember the content and remember you as a brand, it's me and my company that you come to. So we're kind of, you know, I turn up at events and people go, oh yeah, Lorna, you're um you're that my my events company. Yep, yes, that's who we are. That's that's where I see it being. We really hold that space in the market. If you're a business owner and entrepreneur, you'll want us on your team to deliver your events. Incredible. Um, what's it like picking your own team now? Um, you know, you are, you know, working with people underneath your umbrella, um, your brands. Um, how, how does that feel? You get to, you know, you're putting job adverts out now and you get to pick people to join your team. You know, how, how does that feel? Um, scary and liberating. I, um, it's an interesting one. So I, I did the first time I felt really responsible for the person. The first person I took on was my VA and she's fab. Um, she does some really good work, but we have always had that agreement that um, our relationship will grow as the business grows. So um, I never committed to too much too soon. And she really understands the values of the business. Um, and she was there to see the growth of my, my events. Um, and I think, I, I don't really think of them as my staff. They're very much my team. And when I speak to them, I'm always saying, we need to do this and we need to do that because it's not just me, it is them as well. They are part of this. I'm not telling them to do anything. Um, I might ask them to do a couple of things for me or I might set them a few projects to get on with, but it's really liberating to be that kind of, enabling boss this is what I need you to do you are an expert at what you do as your job let me know if you need anything and I need it by Friday and, and I just leave people to do what they're really good at and what they're talented at and that's that's an amazing feeling to be able to gift someone that autonomy mm. and to just be good at what they do and offer help and support where they need it I can be very short. I'm a red personality type. So sometimes I forget to say please and thank you and hello at the beginning of my emails. I am not so obtuse that I don't recognize my own failings, but they get it. They understand me um, and we understand each other. So that's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Amazing stuff. For anyone who's listening, you know, who, who you know, some, some cops might watch this back on replay or you know, might watch this or come across your story um, and they're feeling the same they're stressed, they can't see a way out, they've got physical signs due to that stress, uh, they may be off sick right now, um, and they know something's out there for them, um, but they're just, you know, something's holding them back, it could be their spouse, it could be, you know, a fear. What wisdom could you give to that person who's watching right now to, you know, to, to get this sorted? First one would be to talk to somebody about it. Um, you're not on your own. You might feel that I'm the only one that feels this way. I'm the only one that's not able to manage my job. Um, believe me, you're not. Um, and that's certainly one thing I found from this whole community is actually it's a group of people who all feel the same in one way, shape or form. We've all got different stories, but it comes down to the same thing. And my second bit of advice would just be to start asking some questions. Start arming yourself and controlling the things you can control so you can go and find out a bit more information about a new job about starting a business you can go and find out some information about the success quick start day um, and that's that's no plug that's what I did I thought I I don't know who this guy is I don't know what this is all about but I'm going to go along and find out um, I, I can do that and if it's not for me it's not for me um, but it might be and even if I'm not ready for it right now, maybe it's something I'll use in the future. So really just start asking questions and find out what your options are. Mm. And you might find that actually the world just starts to open up a little bit and things start to point you in the right direction. Amazing stuff. It's, it's just great. You know, there's a great quote that you don't drown by jumping in the water. You, you drown by staying there. Um, and it's something I've always kept in mind, um, especially when, you know, with my situation back in the, when I was um, a few years back before business. So um, Lorna, where can people reach out to you? Where can people get in touch? They might want to, you know, pick your brain or find out more about your business. They might be even getting married. They might have business events to run. Where can people reach out to you? Okay. So if you are getting married, um, please do reach out to me. I'd love to help. 
um, you can either drop me an email at Lorna at myomyevents.com. Um, you can reach out to me on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram, my and my events and my and my weddings. Uh, the handles on both. Drop me a direct message or drop me an email um, and I'll get back to you. Amazing stuff. Guys, girls, ladies and gentlemen, Lorna Reeves. Thank you so much for your time, Lorna. Um, and I believe you're popping off for another webinar right now, right? You are, you're a lady in demand now. So um, no, it's really good stuff. I hope everyone got inspiration from this. You know, Lorna continues to inspire myself, the cohorts, the team at Shift Success. Um, we're going to be bringing in more Facebook Lives as well. We've got a few lined up with other cohort members and also people that we believe, uh, you know, fit the kind of same ethos as Shift Success, which will be announced in the group. If you did like this, give us a like, engage, so we do know you want more of them. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for all your work you're doing due to this pandemic that we have. And uh, we will see you soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Cheers, Lorna.